I was legitimately concerned about how clickable Ulysses S. Grant was going to be. <laughs> so if you clicked, then I promise you won't be sorry. Also, thank you for being here. Today, I'm going to be doing this Ulysses S. Grant Civil War Union, even though I'm from Texas, inspired look while I tell you about Ulysses S. Grant, who is one of America's most significant yet highly underrated historical figures. Now understand that I'm giving you very much an abridged version <laughs> of his story. I'll put some links below to some videos and other resources that you can check out if you want to learn more. So without further ado, let's talk about it. So Ulysses S. Grant was actually born Ulysses H. Grant. And I'll explain what that is about as we progress. But little Ulysses H. Grant, it was never thought that he would amount to much. The kids in his town actually gave him the nickname of Useless Grant. <laughs> Children, am I right? When he was a young adult, his father took the liberty of enrolling him in the West Point Military Academy, even though Useless H. Grant really had no interest in being a soldier. But it was kind of like, well, what else am I going to do? So he went. Now, when he gets to West Point, they give him his papers and everything, and he notices that it's got Ulysses S. Grant on all his stuff. And he's like, hey, my name is Ulysses H. Grant. And they were like, oh man, that's too bad. They were just like, well, that is who you are now, congrats. Literally just a typo, completely changed his name. And so now that his initials were U.S. Grant, his classmates came up with a little bit more flattering nicknames of United States Grant, Uncle Sam Grant. So while he was at West Point, the Mexican-American War broke out. And this was when Grant's real talents finally showed through. Turns out he was a pretty dang good general in wartime. He's always, always described as being very cool, calm, collected under pressure, very methodical, strategic, and very decisive. There were even some fun stories about him during the Mexican-American War where he did like some trick riding where he hung off the side of his horse as he was running through open fire from the enemy. So that was nifty. He's always described as being an, a really good horseman. After the Mexican-American War, he was still in the military. He was stationed out west, which was a problem because his wife and kids were in the east. So he was very far away from his family. While he was stationed out there, he became very depressed. And this was when he developed a drinking problem. Now, this issue with drinking would unfortunately follow him as part of his reputation for the rest of history. I mean, we're still talking about it, right? But I did appreciate one biographer had pointed out that, you know, we know now that alcoholism is a disease. You know, it's not a character flaw. It's an actual disease that needs to be treated. And I mean, being an alcoholic is still pretty stigmatized today. So you can only imagine how stigmatized it was back then. But while he was stationed out west, he developed this drinking problem and was ultimately asked to resign from his position there. So once United States Grant returned home to his family, he had to figure out a way to make a living. And this proved to be pretty tough for him. You know, he tried a bunch of different things, kind of bounced around between occupations. He just had a hard time getting anything to really stick, it seemed like. So a little side story here, his wife's family were slave owners and he lived on their plantation with him his wife and his children. This was an issue because Grant grew up in an abolitionist family, so he was anti-slavery. A little awkward at the family gatherings. His father-in-law really didn't think much of him, but he did at one point give him a slave, like just gave him a slave. And he ultimately decided to grant this slave his freedom took him down to the courthouse and signed the papers and made him a free man. 
And of course now it's easy for us to hear something like that and say, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the right thing to do, right? But you have to understand that at that time, slaves were an extremely valuable asset. One of the authors that was speaking during the mini series I watched was like, you know, not to be too callous about it, but at that time, that would be like walking away from your house. Not selling your house, but just walking away from it. So that's pretty intense, I feel like. <laughs> and especially at a time when he was like really struggling financially, that's a big move. So in 1860, Abraham Lincoln, ever heard of him? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was elected president to the United States of America. Lincoln was elected president and Southern states said, I, I'm gonna head out. So Southern states decided to secede from the Union. The Union decided to not be okay with that. And the infamous American Civil War began. Now, unemployed S. Grant had never intended to become a soldier again. He didn't want to join the military again. But when Lincoln put out the call for 75,000 men to join the Union Army, some of his former buddies from his military academy days came to him and was like, man, we've literally got like 17 and 18 year olds running around with bayonets in their hands. We could really use someone with some experience. <laughs> so somewhat reluctantly, Grant decided to join the Union Army and was appointed as a general of a small group. So now, if you will, allow me to set the stage of the American Civil War for you. You've got the Union in the North. The Union is anti-slavery. And you've got the Confederacy in the South that is pro-slavery. So although the opposing sides were the North and the South, the fighting was happening in the West and in the East, okay? So try not to get too confused. They referred to them as like the theaters. So the Western theater is where Grant was. Eastern theater is where other things were. We'll get to the East. We're talking about the West right now. United States Grant was with his crew fighting out West. And it was during this time that his reputation of being an exceptional war general came back around. In the West, he was just kicking butt taking names, collecting rent, all the things. Someone in one of the things that I watched said that he was always daring, but never reckless. I thought that was a really good way to put it. The strategy that most kind of employed during that time was, we are here, the enemy is here. So we will go from here to here and attack. And rather than just like, straight A to B tactics, which is what they were frankly expecting. Grant was like, we're gonna go from A and then we're gonna go down and around and up and through and over and back and cut the supply line and <laughs> smoke out the enemy. He won a series of successful battles just by catching the enemy off guard and attacking and when and in ways that they just weren't expecting. One of the battles that he won the generals from the Confederacy side came and asked for his conditions. And his response was no conditions, just immediate and unconditional surrender. And so Uncle Sam Grant now had a new nickname. There was one battle in particular, the Battle of Vicksburg, where the strategery was just mwah. And in fact, the strategies that he employed at that battle are still studied by military forces today. So after a series of long drawn out bloody battles in the West, Unconditional Surrender Grant finally secured full control of the Mississippi River for the Union Army. This was a big get because the Mississippi River was really important for supply lines and things like that. The West was pretty much a done deal. Out in the East though, out in the East is where old Honest Abe was, and Lincoln was dealing with one trash general after another in the East. The generals that he was working with in the East were just a little too cautious, a little too arrogant, just kind of wouldn't get anything done. And the most major problem out in the East went by the name of Robert E. Lee. 
The famed and acclaimed Robert E. Lee was basically the unconditional surrender grant of the South. Now, what you should understand about the American Civil War is that when it started, everyone kind of thought that this would be a quick, easy win for the Union. And frankly, there really wasn't a reason why the Union shouldn't win this one. The North had more men, they had more money, they had more resources. So when the war started, everyone was kind of like, well, it'll be over like next week. They didn't think it would last for four years. But the Confederacy actually showed up and showed out for this war. So while Unconditional Surrender Grant was winning battles in the West, Robert E. Lee was winning battles in the East. Once the Mississippi was officially secured for the Union, Old Honest Abe put General Grant in charge of the entire Union forces. So during the course of the Civil War, he went from being a low-level general to being in charge of the campaign in the West, to being in charge of the entire Union Army. And what's so funny about this is that before the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln didn't even know who Ulysses S. Grant was. He wasn't, he wasn't anybody. He was unemployed S. Grant, remember? And the big climax of the Civil War was his face-off with one Robert E. Lee. So the best general in the North was facing off with the best general in the South. Now, I probably don't have to tell you how it ended up. The Union won the war, but it wasn't an easy win. And when Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate troops, Unconditional Surrender Grant presented Lee with some conditions for their surrender. And these conditions were very generous. He let them keep their guns, he let them keep their horses, and he paroled all of the Confederate forces. Set them free, basically, right? He was basically like, everybody just needs to go home and get back to work. And he famously would not allow his men to gloat or celebrate the win. He really understood that now was a time for reconciliation and reconstruction, which it very much was. So unfortunately, although Grant played a major role in winning the Civil War, and it could very well be argued that they would not have won the Civil War had it not been for Grant, his reputation took a big hit just because people during and after the war were extremely critical of his war tactics. You see, old unconditional surrender Grant he was always playing the offensive, you know, attack when they least expect it, attack when they're at their weakest. If the enemies push, you push back and you push back hard. By the end of the Civil War, more than 600,000 men lost their lives between the North and the South. And Grant was labeled as a butcher. People thought that he just was this ruthless, heartless man who just threw his troops at the enemy when the reality was that he did what he had to do to win the war. Now, Lincoln was reelected in 1864, of course, but not even a week after Lee surrendered to Grant, Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head and killed. Following this tragic event, Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's VP, was promptly sworn into office. And OMG, what a headache this man was. You see, following the Civil War came an era of reconstruction and infamously a really rough time in American history. Just because the North had won the war didn't mean that the South was all of a sudden cool with African-American rights and freeing the slaves and all of that. And the South, not just the South, but I mean, parts of the country, folks were still being a little naughty here and there. And Andrew Johnson was just very soft on the South during this time. And he really didn't enforce these new principles and ideas strong enough. And this, this really frustrated old United States Grant. So Andrew Johnson did not get reelected for a second term. Shocking, right? And by that point, everyone kind of 
looked to old United States Grant for some help. And again, it was kind of that thing of like, he didn't really want to be president, but he and Lincoln had formed a pretty strong bond while he was fighting for the Union. And he very much believed in the vision that Abraham Lincoln had for America. He very much believed in equal rights amongst the citizens. So he was easily elected in 1872. He had overwhelming support from the troops and the veterans, especially. Now, the unfortunate thing about his presidency is that his cabinet would encounter corruption. I'm not gonna get into the details on all of that because I don't feel as though it's that important to Unconditional Surrender Grant's legacy, but there were some corrupt politicians that were in his cabinet, not him himself, but folks that he worked with basically. And so this was just another thing that those detractors, his critics, could hold against him basically. But what I would like to tell you more about are some of the things that he accomplished as president. So number one, he passed the 15th amendment to the United States constitution, which granted all citizens the right to vote. Not only that, but this little group called the Ku Klux Klan kind of surfaced around the time that Grant was president and they were wreaking havoc on the South. Unconditional Surrender Grant responded to the KKK by enforcing martial law in the South, which was basically interfering with military power and broke up the KKK. There was some kind of like um, KKK act that he passed, which basically abolished and delegitimized their organization. One of the things that I read about him that I really appreciated was uh, Frederick Douglass, who was a famous abolitionist social reformer that worked relatively closely with Grant during his time in office, as well as with Abraham Lincoln. Frederick Douglass once said about Ulysses Grant, I have to read it because I don't have it memorized. About Ulysses S. Grant, he said, in him, the Negro found a protector, the Indian, a friend, a vanquished foe, a brother, an imperiled nation, a savior which I feel like is a great way to sum up Ulysses S. Grant. Now, once Uncle Sam Grant concluded his two terms as president, he and his wife went off and traveled the world for two years. He was like, later, he did an Obama, he went wakeboarding with billionaires. But once he returned home, uh, Uncle Sam Grant was once again unemployed as Grant because the president of the United States of America did not receive a pension back then. So he had no incoming money. Isn't that absurd? Like after everything that this man has done for this country and they, <laughs> he has no money. Towards the end of his life, he fell on hard times. But luckily for him, he had a story to tell. Mark Twain approached him to publish his memoirs. By this point in his life, he had throat cancer, he was very, very sick but he wrote these memoirs in three days before he succumbed to throat cancer. Old Useless H. Grant finished and published his memoirs, which ultimately became one of the best selling and highest rated presidential memoirs of all time. And that is the story of Ulysses S. Grant. I just can't, here's the thing about his story, okay? Yes, he was a very successful war general. Yes, he was a great president of the US. He was our first civil rights president. Despite all of these great things that he did, he didn't do any of it. He didn't do any of it for fame, for money, for recognition, for power even. Although he was the president of the United States, that's not why he did it. He did all of these things for the people for his family, for what he believed was morally right. And that, that is amazing, truly. So let me know what you guys think about our friend, Useless H, United States, Uncle Sam, Unconditional Surrender, Ulysses S. Grant. Also, let me know who you would like to hear about next. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much, so, so much for watching.
And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!